Welcome to Strength and Conditioning Program Design. Um, this is the first of our, let's say, 12 lecture series. I don't think I'm going to divide any of these up into two. So um, first of 12. Um, so a few things about the class. One, hopefully you have the book. And the book is called Periodization Theory and Methodology of Training. Um, the most recent edition is the sixth edition. That is by Tudor Bompa and Carlo Buzzacelli. Pretty sure that's how you pronounce his name. Um, the fifth edition was still primarily or first authored by Bamba, but there was another author on there, uh, Gregory Half, or Hoff is how he actually pronounces it, even though it looks like Half. Um, and so the book did change a little bit between the fifth and sixth edition. Oftentimes they just kind of update the graphics, um, but they did split the chapters up and, and write it a little bit differently with the sixth edition. So hopefully you're able to get the newest edition of the book. Um, so a bit about this class. So in terms of periodization, so periodization is obviously a theory of training, and it is the theory of training that um, the National Strength and Conditioning Association really favors. Um, and because this class and the strength and conditioning minor are geared toward preparing you for certification through the National Strength and Conditioning Association, so through the NSCA, um, specifically, I'm trying to prepare you for the uh, Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist Test, the CSCS exam. Um, because periodization is, is such a big part of that exam, um, that's the we're going to use the go-to textbook for periodization, and so that's why we're using this particular book. As you'll see as we go along, I have a number of gripes about this book, um, but the layout of the class and the layout of the lectures just follows the 12 chapters of the book. Again, because that's a lot of the material that you'll be tested on if you take the CSCS exam. So broadly speaking, what is periodization? So periodization is dividing the training cycle into periods, right? That name makes sense. Um, and so each period is going to have some sort of a goal. So you may have a goal of a, of a specific training period of increasing muscular strength or increasing muscular power, cardiovascular endurance, muscular endurance, um, increasing, there, there could even be psychological goals. There's a number of different things you can work on within each period, right? But the idea is that we're dividing up the training calendar into multiple periods each with a specific goal. So that's what periodization is. Um, we'll get into some of the historical stuff later, but the gist of it is, so periodization itself um, dates back to ancient athletes, this concept of kind of varying your training intensity, volumes, um, the focus of your training throughout a training cycle. That does date back to um, ancient athletes to some extent. Um, but the more Contemporary, the more modern model of periodization actually comes from the Soviets, comes primarily from the Russians. Um, and if you're not aware, the Soviets, um, particularly starting at the 1956 Olympic Games and then kind of through really into the early 80s, um, the Soviets just dominated the Americans in most Olympic sports. They were really, really good at them, um, especially things like track and field. We didn't stand much of a chance in, in many of those events. Um, and so part of the reason for that is that, I mean, drugs play a role too, but in addition to that um, was that the Russians, uh, the Soviets trained very differently than we did. And so you started to see, um, particularly into the late 70s and early 80s, that there are some American academics that actually translate the Russian literature into English, and we start to see how they're training. And so a lot of these periodization models come to us from uh, Russian authors. And so is, this is basically an adaptation of uh, Russian or Soviet uh, training methods from the mid 20th century. So that's kind of the, the brief history of periodization as a, as a training philosophy. So in terms of training theory, the idea behind training is that we can apply some sort of a stimulus an exercise stimulus probably, but we can apply some sort of a stimulus and then that's gonna cause a physiological or psychological adaptation in our athletes, right? So we can have them squat, like do, do sets of back squats, and then by doing that repeatedly over the course of several sessions, we would anticipate that they are going to improve the strength of their hip extensors. Um, we would anticipate that they're gonna improve possibly the size of the hip extensors, depends on how we set up um, the intensity and volume of the training. But because let's say they've got 
larger, stronger hip extensors, we would anticipate then that they could push off the ground harder and they could probably run faster, right? And so the idea is that we're gonna apply this training stimulus, it's gonna cause an adaptation in the body, and that adaptation is then gonna have a positive impact on their performance on the field. They did squats, they're stronger, because they're stronger, they can run faster, because they can run faster, they're a better soccer player, right? That's kind of the idea behind training. So the intent there is to increase skills and work capacity to optimize performance. Um, so in that example, I was emphasizing that we're going to uh, increase their work capacity. Um, but we can also, and this book talks a lot, there's, there's a lot of coaching overlap in this book. Um, they talk a lot about skills improvement as well. Because obviously, even if you're the fastest uh, soccer player on the field, if you can't dribble or shoot, you're not that good of a soccer player, right? So we also have to work on increasing skills. And so in setting up our training, we're always gonna start from a set of realistic and achievable goals or SMART goals, right? So you're probably familiar with the concept of SMART goals, but briefly what that means, so a SMART goal is a goal that is specific, it's measurable, it's achievable, realistic, and timely, right? So um, a, a, in terms of going through all those things, so if a goal is specific, um, a non-specific goal would be, I want to be a better hockey player, right? How do we measure better? How do we determine whether or not you're better? And so a more specific goal is, I want to be able to um, skate from goal line to goal line in a certain time, right? That's a specific goal. We can tell whether or not you've hit that goal. And as, being, as part of being specific, it's also measurable. So it's something that we can quantify. Um, so again, oftentimes people will set these really um, broad, wishy-washy, not very specific goals. Again, things like, I want to be better at something, I want to get stronger, I want to be faster, have a, be a better batter, whatever it is, but it has to be something that's specific and measurable. Um, achievable and realistic go together as well. So achievable and realistic, um, basically that you wouldn't go from saying, um, I was a C-level player last year out, you know, on uh, I was a bottom C-level player out of six total teams, and I want to be a, an A-level player this year. That's probably not the most realistic thing. Uh, it's probably not achievable, right? Or the same kind of thing, if, you're, if you say, you know, I want to put um, 300 pounds on my bench press this year, right? Like, that's obviously not realistic, but, but something to that extent, right? So that's not something that's achievable. It's not physically possible. It's not realistic. And then timely, you want to have a time frame. So you want to say, by the end of the summer, so in the next three months, I want to have added 10 pounds to my bench press, right? So that's a specific goal. It's measurable. I can see whether or not I've added 10 pounds. It's probably achievable. It's pretty realistic. 10 isn't a huge number, um, especially depending on your starting point. 10 pounds, 100 pound bench press is a, obviously a 10% increase, but if it's a 200 pound bench press, now you're only talking 5%, so that's a little more uh, achievable and realistic. And then timely, you know, again, there's a, an, a, uh, timestamp that we wanted to achieve that by, which is the end of the summer, so in three months of training. So you can see one of the things in this book, and as I mentioned, as we go along, I'm going to talk about gripes. Um, so one of the things in this book is they do have a glossary, but they don't define a lot of the really important terms. And as we'll talk about later on, um, some of the terms move around, which drives me crazy, um, because they're not in the glossary, even though they use them a bunch. So anyway, um, so in attempting to define training, so training is a process by which an athlete is prepared for the highest level of performance possible. So the idea is that we are going to apply training stimulus, training stimuli, multiples, to uh, make them a better athlete, right? Um, to improve their throwing accuracy, to improve their um, batting power, you know, increase their number of home runs, whatever it is that we're trying to do. So there's a number of different parameters that we can target to try to improve their overall performance on the field or on the court. So one possible target of training is multilateral physical development. What is that? This is one of the terms that this book uses a lot that drives me crazy. But the gist of multilateral physical development is it's kind of a general fitness. It's basically that the athlete is able to do a bunch of different things. They're able to run and change directions and they can dribble. Um, they can do a variety of different physical skills. So generally speaking, um, multilateral physical development, a way to conceptualize that, again, is general fitness, but it's, it's um, 
sort of a, a broad set of abilities. You can do a variety. They're, they're an athlete, if you will. They can do a bunch of different things, right? It's not that just that they are a pitcher in baseball and that they can't hit it all and they're not a very good runner and they're really awkward on defense, those kinds of things, right? That's not what we want. Um, so multilateral physical development is they're kind of a jack of all trades, if you will. So you we're working on their general uh, physical fitness. Then building upon that, once they've got this base where they are uh, pretty athletic, so they're fairly agile, they're fairly fast, um, somewhat powerful, right? They can do a bunch of different things. Uh, then we can start working on more sport specific physical development. So in doing that, we can work on or look at the specific um, strength or endurance or speed or flexibility needs of a particular sport, right? So um, some sports are, you know, pure strength. So things like powerlifting, where the competitive events are squat, bench press, and deadlift. Um, some things are more power. So where it, you have to be able to be really explosive. So things like the high jump or the long jump. Um, some sports are more endurance-based. So things like uh, triathlon um, or cross-country running, more common one there. Um, and then some maybe flexibility based like gymnastics. And then oftentimes a lot of our sports are really combinations of things. So, um, a lot of the most common sports that many of you probably played growing up and many of you hope to coach, I assume are like sp our speed endurance sports. Um, or one of the other ways I'll refer to them as interval sprint sports. So things like soccer, like basketball, lacrosse, hockey to some extent, they're all, those are all interval sprint sports or speed endurance sports. So you gotta be fast, gotta be able to run really fast for a very short period of time. And then you're either gonna be jogging or walking briefly. So you get that rest interval. And then you're gonna have to sprint again, right? So we see that in basketball when somebody, you know, there's a fast break, everybody sprints down the court and then the, the offense sets up, the defense sets up probably depending on the extent of the fast break. Um, so you get some, some level of setup. So everybody's kind of catching their breath for a second. And then we're gonna run back down to the other end of the court and very similar thing in, in those other sports I mentioned. Um, so we can develop the specific um, needs of the sport. Um, one of the ways that this book's gonna to refer to these is as biomotor abilities. So things like power, strength, speed, endurance, the book is gonna to refer to those as biomotor abilities. So we can develop the specific ones that they need for their sport. Then they gotta be able to do the technical skills of the sport. So the technical skills are things like, if we're talking about baseball, you gotta be able to throw accurately. If you're a pitcher, you gotta be able to, to you know, pitch and locate your fastball, locate your off-speed pitches, um, gotta be able to hit, those kinds of things. Those are the technical skills of the sport. Soccer, being able to dribble and shoot, basketball, same concept, right? So those are the technical skills of the sport. So not only do you have to have the physiological base that you're able to sprint and recover and sprint and recover, but once you get the ball, you gotta be able to do something with it. And so that's developing those technical skills. And then the tactical abilities, that's the strategy. So now that you can sprint and recover and you can dribble the ball and you can shoot well, now you gotta know where the open player is gonna be. And so those are your tactical abilities. You have to be able to anticipate, you have to recognize what defense the other team is running so that you know where to locate your passes, those kinds of things. So that's uh, tactical abilities are what we get through uh, things like running scout teams, uh, practicing our plays, watching film. Those are typically our, our tactical abilities that, that we're trying to work on with the athletes. Then psychological factors. Um, you know, having them, so if you're, if you're thinking about a sport, um, like golf is obviously one where there's a pretty big psychological component. And same kind of thing with a batter in baseball and, and probably a pitcher in baseball where it's, it's just you, you know, for a batter, it's just you out there against the pitcher and everybody's watching you, right? All eyes are on you to see if you're gonna do anything. Um, golf, same concept. You're the only one out there uh, getting ready to putt and everybody's watching you. And so how do they deal with that psychologically? Do they let that get in their heads that everybody is watching them or are they able to focus and tune all of that out and then perform at a high level? So some of the training that we do may be geared toward um, those psychological factors. Another thing that we're gonna talk about, um, especially from a, cause that's more of a, you know, the sports psychologist job. Um, but one of the things that we'll do from a strength and conditioning standpoint is to have them practice situations where they're fatigued. Um, so, you know, fourth quarter, third period, kinds of situations where we have them, we just wear them out 
to get them ready to perform under a state of fatigue. Um, and so that kind of ties in with the psychological factors. Health maintenance, um, that we build in rest periods. So as part of periodization, there's always what is referred to as the transition period. And so that's usually right after the season where we allow the athlete time to recover physically and mentally. Um, you want the athlete to be able to get away from the game um, because if your athletic experience has been anything like mine or uh, you know, any of the athletes I've worked with, at the end of the season, like you're just kind of done. You don't, you don't want to go back to the rink, you don't want to go back to the gym, et cetera. Um, and so one of the things that you do in the transition period is you let them get away from that activity enough that they want to come back, like that they want to be back in the gym, they want to be back at the rink, um, et cetera. So health maintenance is, is giving them a physical break and a mental break from the sport. Injury resistance. So in each of our sports, there's going to be particularly injured, particular injury risks. Um, so thinking about somebody like a baseball pitcher, right? Um, they are particularly prone to labrum tears in the shoulder and to rotator cuff issues and to biceps tendon issues. Um, your soccer players, uh, particularly female soccer players, are uh, fairly prone to ACL injuries. And so what we'll do as part of our strength and conditioning program is to build in exercises to minimize their injury risk. So with uh, using the baseball pitcher example, we'll do a bunch of rotator cuff stuff, a bunch of scapular stabilization um, to try to minimize um, the damage to those, those structures in the shoulder. Same thing with our soccer players. We'll have them do a bunch of like hamstring exercises, a bunch of uh, plyometric or jumping type activities and really focus on the landing so that they are resilient um, in terms of those plyometrics, but also so that they have good mechanics. Um, so we'll work on addressing the specific injuries that are inherent to those sports and minimizing those. And then the last thing on there is theoretical knowledge. So ideally, we want our athletes to be fairly independent, right? So we want them, um, once they are, you know, particularly once they're into high school and then beyond, to understand training theory, but also to understand things like nutrition, uh, the importance of sleep, those kinds of things, because we're not gonna be with them all the time as sport coaches or as strength and conditioning coaches. So we need them to understand the importance of glycogen replenishment, of um, consuming lean proteins and, and doing those things to help refuel, but also, you know, depending on the sport, maybe we wanna keep um, their body fat relatively low, so they have a high strength to weight ratio or whatever it is, whatever the needs of the sport are. Um, we want them to understand that theoretical knowledge so that they make good nutrition decisions, they make good sleep decisions um, when they are away from the uh, sport environment. So, you know, when they're at the restaurant by themselves, when they're at the hotel by themselves, those kinds of things. We want to help them make good choices. And in terms of theoretical knowledge, we want them to understand why that's important. So why they want to consume lean proteins, why they want to um, have a high carbohydrate meal after working out, not Bud Light or something, right? Um, why that's important in terms of uh, being able to recover and perform again the next day or the next, in the next couple days. So in terms of classification of skills, um, again, one of the terms that this book uses a lot is biomotor abilities. So biomotor abilities are kind of the parameters of performance. So as you can see there, that includes things like strength, but also muscular power, um, speed, muscular endurance, cardiovascular endurance, coordination, meaning things like agility, but also coordination, meaning um, ability to perform the, the technical skills of the sport. So those are their biomotor abilities. But generally when we're talking about those, we're gonna be talking about strength, muscular strength, power, speed, muscular endurance, cardiovascular endurance, and agility. Those are kind of the big ones that we're gonna hone in on. So in terms of classification of sports skills, so they can be cyclic. Um, so examples of cyclic, cause it's easier to give an example and then describe them. So examples of cyclic skills include things like running, uh, cycling, like riding a bicycle, rowing, swimming for most of the strokes. Um, those are all cyclic skills. And so in a cyclic skill, there is an obvious cycle. So in the case of running, um, you know, there, there's two big parts to gait. So gait meaning walking or running. Um, 
there's two big parts to that. There's the stance phase and the swing phase, and each of those can be broken up into sub phases. But basically during the course of running, you just alternate between stance and swing, stance and swing, right? Just back and forth, right? That's a cyclic skill. Um, same kind of thing with um, like rowing, for example. There's four different phases to the rowing stroke, not as familiar with those, but there are four of them uh, in most breakdowns. And you basically pull, so you, you, know, you extend, um, at the hips, at the knees, and then you, you, you uh, extend at the shoulders and flex at the elbows during a running stroke, and then you come back to the starting position and then you, you pull again, right? So those are cyclic skills and you just do them over and over and over again. Acyclic skills are more, you do, you perform the skill once and then you do something else, right? So in the case of basketball, since I have a basketball player on there, jump shot, that would be an acyclic skill. Um, Dribbling, however, would be cyclic, right? Um, but the acyclic skills are just like, there's an obvious beginning and an end to the skill. A baseball pitch is an acyclic skill. There's the wind up and the release, right? There's phases in between, but that's the gist of it. Um, so those are your acyclic skills. And then there are things that are combined. So that's most of our sporting activities. Um, so in the case of, you know, thinking about somebody, a sport like soccer, where somebody's gonna be running, cyclic skill, they're going to be dribbling, still a cyclic skill, and then they're going to shoot an acyclic skill, right? And so that is an acyclic combined. So most of the sports that we are going to deal with are, um, are acyclic, acyclic combined sports. Um, in terms of the organization of training, so training is an organized process whereby the body and mind are constantly exposed to stressors of varied volume and intensity. The idea um, here is that by exposing the body to a stimulus that it hasn't been previously exposed to, you're gonna cause an adaptation, right? So if you lift more weight than you are normally accustomed to lifting, then that's gonna damage the muscle. The muscle is gonna repair itself. It'll respond by um, laying down extra connective tissue. It'll, it'll respond by, eventually, if you do enough training sessions, it'll respond by uh, generating new actin and myosin, more of the contractile proteins. And so as a result, it's gonna get bigger and stronger. That's our adaptation. And then because it's bigger and stronger, again, you can do things like run faster, jump higher, all of those things. So one of the key things here though, is that, that um, to foster adaptations, um, positive adaptations anyway, because you can develop negative ones too. The idea is that to foster adaptations, we have to progressively increase the stimulus, but it can't be too much because if we go from doing nothing to doing a lot of something, then we can basically overload the muscles, overload the bones, overload the athlete mentally, and then they're going to perform poorly. So you're gonna get a, a maladaptation or, or an adverse adaptation to that program. So the idea here then is this concept of progressive overload. So I go and let's say I, I haven't worked out before. So we're gonna take an athlete who is, or uh, an individual who is completely untrained. Um, and so we're gonna maybe have them do a set of 10 body weight squats, right? Maybe two sets of 10. And by doing that, they're probably gonna be sore, right? That's more than they're used to doing. And so we've, by doing that, we've damaged the muscle. The muscle will need a few days to rebuild itself, but after it's able to recover, now the muscle is going to be a little bit stronger. And that same workout, if we do those same, you know, that same set of 10 of body weight squats, you're not going to be sore again because you've adapted to that exercise, probably. So one of the things here, um, and this is kind of out of context for this slide, but that's okay. Um, one of the things in terms of progressive overload is you, you probably maximize adaptations to a particular uh, training stimulus in about four weeks, right? So if we do a set of 10 of bodyweight squats today, if we do it the next, let's say today is Monday, um, if we do it today and then we do it the following Monday, um, that's a pretty long rest interval, but let's say we do that, uh, they're probably not going to be sore the next time, but maybe they are, right? But they'll be less sore than they were the first time. So if we keep doing that same one set of 10, by the end of four weeks, certainly, and maybe in as little as two weeks, they will have adapted to that stimulus. So what we have to do to continue to foster adaptations, if we keep doing the same thing, they're not gonna to continue to get stronger. So we have to either increase the intensity, so they have to lift more, 
Um, so we maybe have them hold a weight that would increase the intensity of the exercise, or we increase the volume of the exercise. So we can do that a couple different ways. We can do two sets of 10 the next time we have them work out, or we can have them squat Monday and again on Wednesday, right? So either way, we're increasing the volume. They're, they're doing 20 total squats. Let's say they do one set of 10 on Monday and one set of 10 on Wednesday, or two sets of 10 on Monday. Either way, they're doing 20 total squats instead of 10, right? So that's the idea of progressive overload. You have to, to do enough to challenge the body, to make it adapt. And, and so one of the things um, with that, you have to be, you don't have to be, <laughs> Um, but you're probably going to be uncomfortable to foster adaptation, right? You're going to lift enough weight that you're probably going to be sore, or you're going to run so fast that it's pretty uncomfortable, right? And so, because the body doesn't, doesn't want to change, it doesn't want to adapt, it wants to stay as it is, and it wants to use as little energy as possible. And so fostering that adaptation tends to be pretty uncomfortable. So if we do too little, you know, don't lift enough weight, don't do any more than they're accustomed to, um, you're not going to foster adaptation. If we do too much, so let's say we go from, take this completely sedentary person, and rather than having them do one set of 10 body weight squats, I have them do like 10 sets of 10, right? We just keep going, just keep grinding them. Um, have them squat until they can't squat anymore, until they can't stand up. What's going to happen then is you're actually going to do too much damage to the muscle. And by doing that, they're going to be super sore. So they're going to have delayed onset muscle soreness. Certainly, um, by the next day, and particularly days two and three after the initial exercise. Um, and it may be enough damage that you're actually going to give them rhabdomyolysis, which is where you've, you've done so much damage to the muscle that you've caused some of the proteins that are normally inside the muscle, things like myoglobin, to leak out, which as we talked about in structure and function, can get caught in the kidneys and cause kidney damage, right? But from a training standpoint, it can take up to a month for that muscle to recover from that extensive damage that we see in rhabdo. So they had one really intense workout, now they can't train again for a month, right? And so we don't want that either. So too much can cause, um, you know, cause muscle tears, can cause um, stress fractures if we're talking about endurance exercise. So there's kind of that happy medium. We just build up a little bit each week. Um, the general guideline is you increase by 10% a week, but you know, as I gave the example a minute ago of we're going to go from one set of 10 to two sets of 10, that's a hundred percent increase. Um, but because it is relatively low intensity, because we're using body weight rather than like throwing 200 pounds on their shoulders, because the intensity is fairly low, they'll probably be able to withstand that big of a jump. But what we don't want to see is particularly with endurance exercise, where somebody goes from running 10 miles a week to 20 miles the next week to 40 miles the next week, right? We don't want to see big jumps like that. Those kinds of jumps in volume tend to lead to things like stress fractures. And so we want, uh, we want to be a little more progressive than that, not these big jumps in volume. And so the idea here is that you're going to provide this training stimulus. So again, maybe they're going to do a set of 10 on squats. And so then after that, they're going to be sore and the muscles are going to be a little bit weaker. And so this is what, that's what this is depicting here, is you're going to see a reduction in muscular strength and a reduction in muscular power. But then once they've recovered, now they're ready to go again. They're actually a little bit stronger than they were the first time. And so now we're going to do our, let's say, two sets of 10, right? And so you're going to see a little bit of a performance drop off after that, reduction in muscular strength, reduction in muscular power. They're going to have some soreness. Um, but then we're going to allow them to recover again. So they're going to, again, um, you're going to see some changes in the muscle cell. We'll talk about those in a little bit. And they're going to adapt. And then the next time, now maybe we do three sets of 10, or now maybe we have them hold, you know, a, a 10 or 20 pound dumbbell when they do their squats. And so the idea here is that we just progressively cause the body to adapt by overloading it just a little bit more than it's used to. And then we get these adaptations where their new baseline is up here. So they can squat a lot more weight than they could four or eight weeks ago, right? Um, one of the things that we see in terms of training mistakes, particularly with endurance exercise, and I myself am guilty of this, uh, is that we apply a stimulus. So let's say, you know, and, and I kind of went over this, this type of example and structure as well, is if somebody says, well, I'm gonna go train for a half marathon, I'm gonna go train for a 10K. What they're gonna do oftentimes is they're gonna go run three miles, five miles, seven miles, whatever. Um, but they typically run at the same intensity. So the, the volume has changed, but basically the intensity of the exercise stays the same. They usually run, 
you know, somewhere around 70% of their aerobic capacity, maybe a little bit higher, but somewhere around 70% of their aerobic capacity is about where most people self-select. Um, so initially with that, let's say five mile run, you know, you're gonna see some soreness, you're gonna see some reduction in muscular strength power, uh, et cetera, for a couple days. Then they're gonna recover and then they go on the same run. And they may do a little bit of damage, a little bit of additional damage to the muscle, but probably not much. And then they just keep doing the same thing, right? And so what ends up happening then is because they haven't changed anything, because they do the same program over and over and over again, you just, you get those initial set of adaptations. And then as long as you keep applying the same stimulus, you don't continue to get adaptation. So again, the way that most people train for things like um, half marathons, marathons, um, not most people, but the way a lot of people train for them is they just add miles. Um, but the, the intensity of those miles is always the same. And so they're gonna make an initial adaptation, but not much beyond that. They're probably not gonna improve their aerobic capacity much beyond after the, the first give or take month of training. So takeaway for you, every approximately four weeks, something needs to change. So either you increase uh, the intensity, so you run faster, you lift more. Those are common ways to change intensity. Um, or you increase the volume. So you add another set, you, you um, add some more miles, those kinds of things. But the other way to go is we do too much. <laughs> so, um, and you see this sometimes, usually this is more of a new exerciser thing. So um, we'll stick with the endurance training example. Somebody goes out for a run and then before they recovered, you know, let's say they, they're like, I'm gonna be uh, a really elite level half marathoner even though I've never done it before. So they go for a run this morning and they're like, okay, still a little bit sore, but whatever, I'm gonna go for a run again this afternoon. And then I'm gonna go for a run again tomorrow morning. And then I'm gonna go again for a run tomorrow afternoon. And so with that, again, they're gonna increase their risk for things like stress fractures, but also from a psychological standpoint, um, the training just becomes exhausting. They don't have the mental energy to devote to it. They, you know, they don't wanna be there. Um, because again, a lot of this training, you know, if you're in the weight room, if you're running sprints, if you're doing endurance training, the training tends to be at least somewhat uncomfortable, right? And so you, if you're not in the frame of mind that you want to be there, that you want to be engaged in the training, you're not gonna tolerate it. And so you just sort of get, um, the, the term for this is overtraining. They've just been in there so long and they've been grinding away so long, they just don't wanna do it anymore. And so that's, that's someone who's overtrained. And so we're gonna see a drop off in performance because mentally they're not there and the muscles, the bones, et cetera, haven't had enough chance to recover. So physically they're not there as well. So, one of the things to understand about the way that the body adapts to exercise is that it responds with fairly specific adaptations to certain stimuli. So in terms of neuromuscular adaptations, if we engage in strength and power type training, so if we do uh, sprints, jumps, lift heavy weight, those kinds of things, the adaptation that we're gonna see to those types of stimuli is that um, the muscle cell is gonna get larger. Um, so you're gonna see hypertrophy is the, the term for that. You're gonna see more ATP, so the energy molecule that directly fuels muscle contraction. So the muscle cell will store more ATP. It'll store more phosphocreatine, which is the molecule that most immediately helps rebuild ATP. You'll store inside of the, the trained muscle, you'll store more glycogen, so sugar. You'll store more of the enzymes to break down glycogen. You'll store more of the enzyme to break down uh, phosphocreatine. So you basically get better at uh, fueling that sprint and power type exercise within the muscle and the muscle cell gets larger, right? In response, and so that's, that's strength and power training. In response to endurance training, it's kind of an opposite set of adaptations. So in response to endurance training, because we're having low intensity contractions for a long time, and those are very dependent upon our ability to get oxygen into the muscle cell. And so in response to endurance training, we're gonna make more mitochondria. We're gonna get more of the enzymes inside of those mitochondria that are involved in breaking down uh, fat, but also proteins and carbohydrates. Um, we're gonna get more capillaries around the muscle cell. And there is some evidence that the muscle cell actually shrinks. And why that would be useful is that a, a smaller muscle cell makes it easier to get uh, oxygen in there to get it to the mitochondria so that we can remake ATP 
using that oxygen, right? So you've got these separate sets of adaptations. On the strength power side, the muscle cell gets bigger, it gets better at producing ATP anaerobically. On the endurance side, the muscle cell potentially can get smaller, um, but it gets, primarily gets better at producing energy aerobically. And so why that matters is if I have an athlete that is a sprint power athlete, say a volleyball player, because um, volleyball players need to be able to jump really high, they need to be able to get from point A to point B on the court really, really quickly, but they typically don't um, do low intensity activity for a long period of time. It's just not part of the sport of volleyball. Volleyball is fast explosive, right? Um, and so if I have this volleyball player who has to be fast and explosive, do a bunch of long runs. If I have you know, this athlete out there running six, 10, 13 miles, then what they're gonna get are adaptations required for endurance performance, but those are not the adaptations that they need for their sport. Um, and so one of the things to keep in mind from a, a specificity standpoint is um, if we do a lot of endurance type work, then that can take away from our strength power performance. Because that's really where you see this come in with coaches. Oftentimes, and it's, it's I think going away, but you know, in a variety of um, strength power sports, again, like volleyball or like football, um, coaches at least used to be of the mindset of like, well, everybody has to have uh, good endurance. They gotta have good wind, right? And so they used to just run football players for miles. Like, um, for example, the, the Packers, um, this is old school football, but the Packers uh, in the 60s and, and into the 70s, one of the tests for the players every year was they had to have under a certain time on their mile. So, um, which if you think about it, right, like think about how big offensive linemen are now. Think about how big defensive linemen are now. To require them to run, I forget what the time was, I think it was like a 10 minute mile or nine minute mile, something like that. Um, but anyway, to require them to be able to run, let's say a nine minute mile, like the, the, the um, physiological demands of the sport are sprint, recover, sprint, recover, sprint, recover. No part of that is be able to run pretty fast for nine straight minutes. Like that's just not, uh, that's a different energy system as we'll talk about, right? So the adaptations are specific. So in terms of um, thinking about training for a sport, one of the things we wanna look at is the energetic demands of the sport and make sure that we're addressing those with our training program. Um, other neuromuscular adaptations um, in our strength power athlete, uh, this again ties back into uh, what we talked about in structure. So remember in structure, we talked about there's two important ways to increase um, muscle, I kind of, I used multiple terms, but um, to increase muscle strength, let's say. So remember that biceps can lift something really small like a TV remote, but then something relatively large like a 35 pound dumbbell, right? Same muscle. So the way that we do lift really light things is um, we recruit small motor units. So we recruit um, type one muscle fibers, the, the slow twitch fibers that are small and not very strong. And then if we need to lift heavier weights, we recruit more motor units. So we recruit some of the two A's and the two X's, right? And so ultimately, if we need a really powerful, really strong muscle contraction, we're gonna recruit all the motor units. So all the type ones, all the two A's, all the two X's. Um, so that's motor unit recruitment, that's one way. Um, and then the other way is what's called rate coding. And so rate coding, remember, is that the motor neuron that activates those muscle fibers um, depolarizes or sends more electrical signals per second. So in our strength athlete, or our really powerful athlete that needs to be able to jump high, we're gonna use both of those at the same time. So they're, they're gonna recruit all their muscle fibers at once, and then they're gonna rate code, so they're gonna send electro, uh, 80 pulses per second down the motor neuron, rather than something like 30 in a lower intensity muscle contraction. The opposite is true in our endurance athletes. So in our endurance athletes, they're only gonna recruit a few of the muscle fibers for any one contraction. Cause if you're running, you know, uh, let's say a, a nine minute mile, you don't have to recruit all your muscle fibers at once. So you recruit maybe a quarter of them, maybe a third of them in uh, one of the quadricep muscles. And then on the next step, you recruit another third, next step, the final third. And then by the fourth step, you're back to the original set of muscle fibers. So that's, um, that is a, a more cyclic recruitment of those fibers um, rather than, or the term for that is asynchronous recruitment of those muscle fibers. So there's different neuromuscular adaptations between strength athletes and endurance athletes as well. As I mentioned, different metabolic adapt adaptations. If you're a power athlete, you get better at producing energy anaerobically. Endurance athlete, you get better at producing energy aerobically. 
cardiovascular adaptations are also different. Our strength power athletes um, tend to see an increase in the thickness of the left ventricle of the heart, not a lot of increase in chamber size. Our endurance athletes tend to see less of an in increase in thickness, but there is some, but they also see a more elastic or more accurately, a more extensible chamber, right? So even the adaptations in the heart differ a little bit. So all of that is to say that you really have to look at the physiological demands of the sport and try to cater the training to that. So it, it may not be helpful to have your volleyball team do a half marathon training program, and in fact, it's probably gonna hurt them. So yeah, they got better cardiovascular endurance, but cardiovascular endurance isn't part of the sport. And they're gonna have adopted different neuromuscular patterns for the endurance training than they actually need for their sports. You might've actually hurt their performance by having them do something to improve their quote unquote general fitness, right? Um, in terms of the phases of adaptation, um, you don't need to know those, I won't ask you about those. But broadly speaking, the important part here is that with our periodization, um, there are really three phases. And so you see two of the phases here. Um, so the three phases in a normal periodized, periodized program, you have the preparatory phase, which is kind of the, the off-season slash pre-season phase. I know the authors of the book are not a fan of the word off-season. Um, but the preparatory phase is kind of the, the off-season phase of the preseason. The competitive phase is the season, including the preseason. And then the transition phase is postseason. So again, that restorative, let them rest, uh, physically and mentally phase. So those are the big three phases of, of a periodized program. The preparatory phase, the competitive phase, and the transition phase. Uh, in terms of the training effects, so those are the way that the body adapts to the exercise stimulus. Um, and we can, we can classify those into three categories, as you can see there. So the immediate training effect is what happens during and, and immediately after the exercise. So for example, if I am running, the immediate training effect is going to be an increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure, um, increase in uh, blood flow to the working muscles, those kinds of things. That's the immediate training effect. That's, that's how my body is. It's an acute response to exercise. It's how the body is dealing with this stimulus that I'm applying to it. Um, the delayed training effect is what happens, obviously, after the exercise. So shortly after, we'll stick with running as an example, shortly after an endurance training session, we're gonna see a reduction in blood pressure, but we're still gonna have a little bit higher heart rate than our resting, but we're gonna see a reduction in blood pressure. Um, we're gonna see that we've depleted our glycogen, um, but in response to that training stimulus, uh, a delayed training effect would be, so how does the body in the relatively short term adapt to that stimulus? So in response to endurance exercise, one of our first adaptations is gonna be that we increase our plasma volume. So remember, your blood has two primary components, has red blood cells that carry oxygen, and then plasma, which is the fluid that they float around in. And so typically within as little as three days, you can see a slight increase in plasma volume. So the blood gets a little bit less, uh, less viscous, so it gets a little bit thinner, so that it makes it somewhat easier to deliver oxygen to the working musculature. So that's an example of a delayed training effect. Um, and then if we do something like strength training, so if we do that for eight weeks consecutively, so probably you know two to three sessions a week, but at the end of those eight weeks, certainly, we'll have seen some muscle growth or hypertrophy, the more correct term for that. So that's a delayed training effect as well. And then over the course of years of training, then we get the cumulative training effect. So the cumulative training effect, um, you know, to, to maximize your physiological adaptations in most sports takes somewhere between eight and 14 years. Um, so the reason that Thor's on there, that's from uh, the summer of 2020 when everybody was doing just like exhibition, you know, one athlete by themselves kind of things, or at least they were in the world of strength sports. Um, and so that's Thor lifting, uh, deadlifting 1,100 pounds. And so... Um, Thor, as far as I know, his highest body weight was somewhere around 440 pounds, right? And so um, he had been involved in strongman even at the highest level since um, at least 2014. And so, you know, he'd been competing at elite level strongman for 
you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or eight years, and he'd been training for it for quite a bit longer than that. So that's that cumulative training effect. You can't just, you know, do one 12 week training cycle and deadlift 500 pounds. It's gonna take multiple years. The muscles have to um, grow large enough, grow strong enough. You have to lay down enough connective tissue and you have to be able to recruit those muscle fibers in the appropriate pattern. And that takes years to do. And so that's that cumulative training effect. All right, and going back over my notes, uh, I know I said at the beginning of this talk that uh, there would probably be 12 lectures, but chapter one's pretty long. Um, and so I'm gonna actually cut this one off uh, at this point, and then I'm gonna pick up and do uh, chapter one, part two, uh, to talk about energy systems. So take a little break, and then when you have time again, pick up with part two.